I'm pleased to be joined by Lawrence Mohn, who since 1995 has served as the president of the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. Welcome to Citywide. Thank you very much. So the Manhattan Institute earned its policy shop spurs, if you will, during the Giuliani years by looking at what seemed to be intractable problems in a new way. Uh, crime, for example, was, uh, was an area of, uh, of focus. So I want to ask you, looking back over the last, say, 15 years or so, was it the fact that you said that the problems were solvable and that they needed to be changed that made the difference, or do you think it was the specific solutions in terms of competition and privatization that, that it, in other words, there's an old B school saying it doesn't matter whether you have centralized or decentralized management as long as you change every 10 years. So was it the direction that Giuliani took the city in or just the fact that he was willing to, to make uh, big changes? Well, I think you have to start with the the fundamental proposition that ideas make a difference and, the, and that, that good ideas create good public policies and bad ideas create bad ones. And certainly as we took a look at the city and where it had been heading in its trajectory through the 60s and 70s, we, we thought the city had taken a lot of wrong directions. And so we started with that fundamental belief that, that there was something that could be done, like an issue like crime or welfare. But then, of course, it was finding the right person and the right idea. And for us, that was George Kelling and his co-author James Q. Wilson in Fixing Broken Windows because it got us out of that kind of left-right paradigm of being hard on crime and soft on that crime. This was more like, let's think about crime in a different way. And if we can approach it in a different way, maybe we can get a handle on the problem. So it's, it's the belief that something can be done comes first, and then I think you look for an idea that's uh, creative and practical. Giuliani had spent pretty much his entire career um, working in government as a, as a prosecutor, short stint as a lawyer. Uh, but embraced the idea that the private sector had a lot of the answers. Mayor Bloomberg has been a private sector guy his entire life, but he seems to be kind of a government activist. Right. What, where would you say the ideological center of, of, of city government is today? Is it, is it well, we just stop. Well, I do. I, I think it has moved somewhat to the center. But perhaps what, one of the reasons is we take all the good things uh, for granted that have happened over the past 10 or 15 years. I think, you know, part of the success of the Bloomberg administration is it saw some things that were done well in the Giuliani administration and decided not to mess with it, whether it be the welfare reform or the crime. crime. Uh, it's right. tried to move a little further on the education. The good news is the economy has been in pretty good shape. Uh, but I think, you know, even the mayor recognizes that perhaps the finances of the city are a little too dependent on Wall Street, and there's probably more things that w we should be doing with the city's economy uh, to, to ensure the future than we are. So I would say that it's definitely it's shifted to the center, but I think part of that is, is taking some of the good news for granted, right. all the things that we've accomplished. Well, Giuliani also, um, uh, I think, came at city government particularly after the scandals of the 1980s with the view that you had to get the bad people out of government. Bloomberg has had the luxury, if you will, of saying, I want to bring the best and the brightest in from the private sector to, uh, to help. I think that the city could have gone either way after 9-11. After it was a, you know, the, it didn't have to continue its, right. its trajectory. What do, you, what do you think the most important thing has been with the city's recovery and, and the prosperity we have at least up until now? Well, I think the fact that there wasn't an attack, and I, you know, again, I, I credit Ray Kelly, you know, who took the accomplishments of crime fighting that, that were started in the Giuliani administration and took them up another step. And actually, we worked with Ray a little bit on this after 9-11, which was the notion that the city itself had to take some responsibility for dealing with terrorism. And he set up his own counterterrorism shop, over a thousand police officers that are currently involved with it. And we helped organize some seminars for Ray in the beginning, bringing in people from Scotland Yard and Tel Aviv to help the New York City police think about, you know, how to deal with this issue. And as a result, a number of plots were specifically identified and broken up. And I think, you know, part of the problem is people feel safe in New York. They know that someday something might happen, but they feel like uh, the city officials and particularly Ray Kelly have a handle on it. So I think, you know, that, that was a big factor. And the, the, the other shoe never dropped. I would expect that, that many of our viewers don't realize how policy gets made. I mean, the fact that a, a, a nonprofit organization um, would be organizing seminars for the police department. Talk a little bit about what, what the day-to-day -day work of the Manhattan Institute is. It, it can vary because, you know, we have various outlets for getting ideas into play. We have the City Journal, which is our quarterly magazine, and so we'll publish articles there by authors like Steve Malanga and, and uh, Saul Stern. And sometimes what happens is those articles are reprinted as op-ed pieces in the New York Post and the Daily News, and politicians will read that, and policy sometimes happens that way. 
Other times is we open up our doors to anybody who's in office or running for office uh, who wants some advice or input on a particular issue, whether it's uh, uh, congestion pricing or uh, combating terrorism. And what we'll try to do is, on an off-the-record basis, you know, bring experts in, give them uh, some advice, and, and hopefully, you know, city officials can take that and, and use it in a useful way. So there's the forums, the meetings, the publications. There's a variety of different ways in which ideas come into play. We had the uh, executive director of the Drum Major Institute on uh, recently, and one of the things that she said that they do was they look to other cities or uh, state governments for models that work because uh, I think we all know that uh, government officials are notoriously risk adverse unless they're desperate, so if you can say to them that somebody else has already tried it out, it makes it a lot easier for them to try a new idea. Um, there are a lot of things like Comstat that New York City has exported to other places. Can you point to some things from around the country where you think other people are doing it better and New York should try it? Well, I think, you know, Steve Goldsmith, who was the former mayor of Indianapolis, did a lot of work on competitive pricing and, and privatization of services in, in the city of Indianapolis. And I think there are some lessons that we could learn from there that would, would be useful in the way we handle services here in the city. I think welfare reform really started in the state of Wisconsin. And as you remember, uh, you know, Jason Turner was recruited uh, by Rudolph Giuliani. So that that's another example of, of a city that... Uh, and a state that have taken welfare reform to another level and, and was used effectively here. I think the whole congestion pricing, you know, model where, you know, the mayor went to London, it's been tried in some other Scandinavian cities. So I think that idea makes a lot of sense because one of the problems about believing nothing can change is we just have the debate amongst ourselves in New York. And sometimes it's good to break out of the box and say, well, wait a minute, you know, somebody's done it. Let's take a look at it and see what's happened. Mayor Bloomberg has tried to make um, education one of his hallmark issues. It's an area that the Manhattan Institute has spent a lot of time on. Why don't you talk a little bit about some of the activities that you've you've been involved with with reforming the Department of Education? Well, you know, back back in the 1990s, Saul Stern and City Journal wrote a lot of articles on uh, the school choice movement. So we were for expanding options, whether it's uh, vouchers, but also charter schools, of which there are a, a great number now in, in New York. We also, with our researcher Jay Green, senior fellow, talked about issues of merit pay, social promotion, and those are some ideas that have been incorporated into um, Chancellor Klein's uh, policies over the past three or four years. Okay, but now I want to I want to I want to draw, if you will, a, an ideological contrast. Sure. The notion of charter schools, I think, caught on for a couple of reasons. One was that you could um, have some competition; the parents Correct. could have some some choice. And that would force the schools to reform if they wanted to uh, uh, to survive. Second was that you could establish some benchmarks, and you could you could look at what worked and what didn't work in a in a smaller form, and then see whether it was That's scaled correct. up. And thirdly was that th at least there would be some small number of kids that had a shot at a better education, whatever the capacity of the charter schools uh, were. So the competition, um, I think, was uh, you know was a uh, was the, sort of the rallying cry behind it. On the other hand. The hallmark of the Bloomberg Klein approach has been centralization. It's mayoral control, Department of Education picking the principals, um, standardization, pushing to, right. to meet uh, test scores. So if we were look at whatever progress has been made in education under Bloomberg, um, is it because of the centralization or is it because of the competition? Well, I think, you know, there have been two phases to the, the, the Klein reforms. I think you're, you're right. When they started out, there was very much a, a top-down command and control situation. But I think, you know, over the past year or so, and, and Chancellor Klein has been pretty explicit about this, he sees the need to kind of decentralize authority to principals, allow them to make more decisions and more accountability. And so, you know, we, we've uh, applauded the, the administration on a number of things they've done in the schools and not applauded them in others. And I think the tendency they're moving towards now is a much more positive direction because it's 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 the largest system by far in the country. It's a million kids. That's as many kids are as educated every day in the state of New Jersey, and you wouldn't really want that all to be done in Trent, from Trenton. So I think uh, the administration really went through two phases there, and I think now it's moving in a more realistic direction that you really can't, you know, control everything from the top, whether it's 110 Livingston Street or, or uh, City Hall. Do you think that the, the was the voucher movement about choice or was it about people who wanted to opt out of value systems? In other words, uh, the parochial schools, yeshivas in the South, uh, people who were concerned about um, uh, integration, uh, just wanted their kids in a, in a different kind of an environment. It wasn't so much 
the quality of the education, they wanted a cultural component to the education that public schools couldn't provide. Is, is, that, is, is that why the voucher movement sort of would flare up in some places and die out? It doesn't seem to have caught hold nationally. Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's, it, there's two reasons why we're still very positive about um, vouchers. And it's, it's the element of choice, uh, and it's also the element of competition. And the element of choice, I think, you know, for the kids on the bottom, for me, it's very much a moral issue. You know, there are a lot of schools, where we call them the SIR schools in New York, where the, the state tells you, guess what, there's not much education going on in this school. I think it's appalling that, you know, if it were my kid, you know, that I can't take my kid out and put them in a school where some learning is going on. So the element of choice for me is, is a moral issue, but there's also the competition effect that once, you know, these schools realize, you know, they won't be open forever, that they might in fact lose some market share, then maybe there's an opening for ideas like merit pay and social promotion. I don't think it's an accident that the union has been less resistant to those ideas, it's more open to those reform ideas, because there is choice out there. So I think it's those two elements. Uh, why choice hasn't gone as far as I would like it to see? I think it's because the dollar amounts aren't that high. You know, we're talking about two or three thousand dollar vouchers, which, as you say, basically fill parochial school seats. I would like us to take a look at special education, where both you know lower class and middle class parents are really unhappy with what's happening, and say, why don't we take that uh, thirty thousand dollars per kid? and see if we can give people more options. And then maybe we'll see some interesting things going on in the way special education is delivered. Uh, Jeb Bush tried that in Florida a couple of years ago, and it's very popular. As a matter of fact, he was up here with Mayor Bloomberg a, um, a couple of weeks ago at one of our events. And, and so I think those are areas where we would like to explore as the choice movement moves on. We will continue this educational conversation with Larry Moan of the Manhattan Institute when Citywide continues right after this. Big dreams and good grades aren't enough to get into college. There are actual steps you need to take. Finding someone who can help is the first and most important. For the next steps, go to knowhowtogo.org. Welcome back to Citywide. We're speaking with Lawrence Moan, president of the Manhattan Institute. It's about 85% of the population of the United States lives in cities but the presidential candidates don't seem to talk about urban issues at all. Uh, partially, I guess, because the early primaries are states like Iowa and uh, New Hampshire, even uh, South Carolina. What can we do to get our elected officials at the national level to pay attention to the issues that are affecting people's lives in the places where they live? It's a very difficult question because, as you said, the politics uh, moves in the other direction. But I, I think the thing I would make the case to our national leaders is that it's, it's cities where public policy actually gets created and where things happen. I mean, I think the great advantage of the Manhattan Institute and other groups who work here in the city is you actually see where the rubber hits the road. And Washington essentially is just a big bank. Money comes in and money goes out. And the politicians really don't have a good handle on how that money is being used. It's really on the state and local level that policies are being executed, whether it's in welfare reform, terrorism, education. And so what I would say to the politicians, if you really want to figure out what are the ideas that are going to make a difference, you should be focused more on cities and what's going on in them. I want to ask you about um, an example where uh, an initiative uh, the city is a victim of its own success. Privatization of uh, tax liens. In the uh, 70s and 80s, while there was disinvestment, people abandoning property left and right, the city wound up as the largest landlord. Owners would walk away from, right. from properties and thousands and thousands of units. Um, and they weren't very good at managing those, uh, those abandoned properties and those vacant lots. The Giuliani administration took a different approach, which was to say that once the debt had accumulated, once people owed property taxes to the city, instead of the city, in effect, foreclosing and becoming the, the owner of that property, they would sell that debt on the commercial market, take the cash, right. and let somebody else deal with fixing up the property, and the private sector would do it. And right. the program's been very successful. As a result, the city owns virtually no land now um, that was acquired by, uh, by that method. On the other hand, uh, because land values are so high, uh, 
We have no place to build affordable right. housing, no place to build schools. NIMBYism rears its head. As soon as you say you want to build something right. someplace, people have a reason to be against it. Do you think we ought to start accumulating land under, under the in-room program again? I don't know if it's necessarily uh, accumulating land, but I do think we need to look at development issues in the city. You know, we have a center at the Manhattan Institute called the Center for Rethinking Development, and uh, it was really created a couple of years ago on the premise that we are kind of in phase three in New York. We had the Bob Moses period where everything was built, but everything was run over, and then we had the Jane Jacobs period where people said, no, people needed input in, into what's going on. And I think we're in a third period where we really have to synthesize the best of both those models. And so what I would say is I think the private sector should still be the major agent of that. But we need to look at some of those rules and regulations that were created in the 70s and 80s that, as you said, have created this NIMBY mentality in the city. And it's not to abandon them, but to, to fix them. For instance, environmental review, a very noble idea. Let's look at the impact of building on the infrastructure of the city. The problem, as you know and I know, nobody really pays attention to the document. It's simply piled up there, and it's a way not to get sued for putting your project in place. We think a very simple method would be just put a time limit on the environmental review so that builders know that uh, an expectation that if they do what they're supposed to, they can get the project done. More density in the boroughs so that uh, it's easier for uh, you know, builders to get the units on, on the land. So, smart growth. Uh, smart growth. And I, that's what I mean. I think we're in phase three, where we understand why the regulations came in the 70s and the 80s as a reaction to the, the wild growth of the 50s and 60s, but now it's time to rethink that. And I think you know we can come to some agreement on how that moves forward. I, I guess also the, the Institute's perspective would be that if we did reform of the rent regulation system in New York, perhaps the government wouldn't have to create as much subsidized housing. That's right. In principle, I agree with rent regulation, but I think there's other practical steps that we could take. I mean, the good news is people want to build in the city. You know, that's, that's a, a, an opportunity that places like Buffalo and Rochester don't have. So I think it's a question of how to do it intelligently. There's a, a sense in many neighborhoods uh, that the middle class is being squeezed out of New York, that um, the city has become unaffordable to them. Housing prices go up, entry level jobs, particularly manufacturing, good paying jobs are, are shrinking, um, and that the city is primarily oriented now towards the more affluent uh, professional workers as well as uh, tourists and other investors from uh, from overseas. What what's the Manhattan view uh, Institute's view on on the affordability issue and some of the things that city government can do about it? Well, I, I think you know it is a cost issue. You know, as you said, the cost of land, the cost of, of food and services. I mean, the best thing to do is is to encourage growth and competition from our standpoint. I think the fact is there is a, a vital middle class in the city. You know, we don't want to neglect the good news. I mean, the census survey showed that in Queens, you know, black middle class Americans are actually um, enjoying a pretty good life out there. So the, the question is, you know, how do you make sure that they have good schools for their kids so that their kids can move up? You know, how do you uh, get rid of regulations that make uh, development of affordable housing uh, uh, out of reach. I, I think those are the, the methods that we'd like to use. So I'm not as much of a pessimist. I mean, certainly Manhattan is a pretty tony place, but we have four other boroughs where millions of people work, and I think there's an opportunity to lower regulation, improve education, and, and really make a, a good middle class life for most New Yorkers. Juvenile justice, I'm going to shift gears completely. It, it, it's, um, it's an area that doesn't get a lot of attention. Um, partially because there are privacy issues associated with, uh, with young people. Um, but it's also a really critical point because if someone goes off the rails when they're a teenager, the likelihood of them turning into uh, a criminal uh, when they're an adult become much more serious. You've done some work in this area. Um, tell me what conclusions you came to and whether you think that the elected officials are, are, are going to be responsive to them. Well, and juvenile justice is a tough issue because by, by the time the kids are in high school or at that age, it's, it's really kind of tough to turn them around. I mean, I think on, on one end, we want to work on the schools and get the elementary schools and, 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 and get those in better shape, and hopefully we can catch kids in an earlier phase. We've actually moved in a certain direction of the Institute now as, as looking at, at at uh, young people, unfortunately, who have been incarcerated or in the system, and what do, we, what do they do when they come out? And that cycle. Uh, and so, and so we, we see you know, rising crime rates in other parts of the country, not here in New York, because you know, young guys are coming out of prison, there's nothing for them to do. So we've kind of figured out that's our next project, is just as we looked at welfare reform for mothers uh, in the 1990s, what can we do for these young guys coming out of prison? So 
we're very much into this whole issue of prisoner reentry, getting these people into jobs. Uh, we've got a project that we're working with uh, Mayor Cory Booker in Newark, is to reorganize all of their efforts uh, in terms of what they do with prisoner reentry, to kind of get a work first principle the same way that welfare was done. And so hopefully we can break the cycle at, at that end. The teenage part is really the toughest nut to crack. It's, it's a place where you know, you're half child, half adult, very hard to reach people. Hopefully, you know, we can do a, a better job on both ends at this point. I think there's a, a misperception among some people that the Manhattan Institute was part of the less government movement. And it sounds to me, in a number of these areas, it's not about less government, it's about better government. It's government focusing on what government should be doing, that's resources right. from other people. It's the role of government. I think that's, that's our point, is that there are some things that government can do, and only government can do, and so we want to make them do it as, as best as possible, and I th certainly think that's what drove our police efforts. But I think in other issues where we feel, you know, in terms of providing housing or development or jobs, that w we should look at rules and regulations that impede the private sector from doing it. So. You're absolutely right. We are not anti-government. We believe there should be a strong, rigorous government. It should do the job that it was meant to do and do it well. So if you look down the road just the next couple of years, there's a lot of uncertainty about uh, the economic conditions in the, in the city. Um, many of us holding our breath, hoping that Ray Kelly continues to be, uh, yeah. to be successful. What do you think the biggest issues facing New York are going to be in the next two to four years? I, it is the issues of, of uh, first of all, growth and in infrastructure. Uh, we've got to build uh, up to the capacity so that new businesses and, and new industries could thrive here. I mean, we're far too dependent on Wall Street, I feel. And what we need to do is make it easier for companies to create jobs in this city and to, and to grow their companies. And so that means getting the infrastructure of the transportation and the water and the energy, the power, I think is going to be very critical. We've got to do those things. We've been ignoring them. But the good news is people still want to come here because, you know, as they say, if, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. So we just have to give people the opportunity to do that. The mayor says that New York has always been an expensive place. He's um, committed to renewing the sales tax. Um, uh, they've cut back the incentive program for uh, r residential uh, real estate development. Is, there, is that side of the affordability equation also important for the business community, property tax reform, just bringing down the cost of doing business in New York? I think so. And I think, you know, the fact is we were in such a boom time that, that that's often overlooked. But someday the, the, the housing market will go down and we'll be looking at those issues again. As I said, we have a Center for Rethinking Development, which is going to release a study in the new year on the cost of construction in the city. Why does it take so long and so much money to build things here as opposed to other places? And if you look even just across the river at Jersey City, a lot of things went up very quickly and cheaply. And, you know, why just going across the river is there a difference? And we're going to find out what that difference is and see if there's something we can do about it. My thanks to Lawrence Mohn, president of the Manhattan Institute, for being on our show and for thinking about these issues facing New York. I'm Ken Fisher. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Citywide.